<laughs> oh. Well, thank you everyone for being here. And as you can see, uh, we're taking this very seriously. Um, and we appreciate you being here. So all about your questions because one of the things that we're promoting, obviously, is the November event. That is November, what is it, 6 through the 8th? Is that about right? 5 and 6. 5 and 6. Well, I got close. Um, and that is, uh, again, uh, voice, let me see if I can spell it right, voice over revolution, revolutionevent.com. Is that correct, Bill? Yes, correct. Got it. Okay, so first off, uh, Mr. Fenoy, since you are in a vehicle in uh, L.A. traffic, getting close to your yep. desk, why don't you tell people about, first off, what are you doing tonight, and uh, what are you going to do uh, when you come to Illinois? Well, first of all, let me apologize because I'm going to have to jump off early, about 15 minutes early this evening. Uh, I am on my way to uh, the SAG after offices to the Don LaFontaine voiceover lab to do a workshop this evening on voice acting for video games. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, I'm just looking at a question. Humberto Franco, uh, again, we're all very sad about the news from France. Uh, I don't oh, know boy. Oh, boy. I just, I just heard that on my way, and, uh, man, I, uh, it, it, it breaks the heart. It breaks the heart. Yeah. Very, uh, unfortunately, there's just too much of thing, too much of this stuff going on, and uh, we pray for all the people who are hurt, killed, and injured. So uh, with that, we'll move on to uh, better topics. Uh, let's go ahead and take questions from the group here. I wanted Somebody asked one right at the top. Laura, Beth, I think it's Ezel. Do I have that right? Um, now, it's funny that you asked this question, Laura, Beth, because she's asking, and Bill, please take note of this question very carefully. Do you know of a service where someone, sound engineer, voice talent, or agent, will listen to a few of your audition reads and give feedback on sound quality? Yeah, well, actually, well, when we're when we're working with a talent, like to produce a demo or something along that line, or in coach, you know, during a coaching session, that's certainly something that we can do. Yeah, and uh, uh, also um, a, a buddy of mine. Uh, uh, George Whittem uh, does that kind of service. And it's funny that you say that. As you know, Mr. Fenoy and Mr. DeWeese, uh, we are carefully looking into finding someone who may be able to help us do the same. And that person, uh, it's not quite like Trump's VP pick, but it'll be someone who are, we are closely guarding. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So we've got some things uh, coming up there. Okay. So... Um, Mm, okay. Okay. So now we got a question from Henriques Devan. I hope I got that right, Henriques. Uh, more voice acting related, but when recording from your home studio, how picky are clients about the specific mic and or preamp you use? Is there a particular standard in the video game or animation industries that they prefer? Uh, for ex so basically, his question is: Does the client care about the gear? Uh, uh, well, since you asked about video games, and uh, what the client cares about is that it sounds crisp and clear, uh, that it's not distorted uh, in any way, that, that they have good sound files. I have yet to have a client ask me what kind of microphone or, or preamp I use. Uh, but that said, my suggestion is, is to get the very best mic and preamp that you can afford. And when uh, time comes that uh, you have a little more money, uh, step up to a better one. Now, Dave, I know that in Bill's case, for the first four years or so, um, he was basically recording with a you know hundred dollar mic in a closet with a bunch of clothes and made a hundred grand doing that. Um, I, you're telling me, Dave, that people who have never used you before. They never say to you, what mic are you using? Is that correct? I never get that. I have never, ever gotten that in many, 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 many years. Now, one of the things on my website, I, I, I let people know what I do use. So if they visited the website, they could find out that, uh, you know, I have great preamps, uh, Neumann and Sennheiser, and now uh, uh, a couple other 
very high end microphones uh, that I use. But you know, they're making great microphones now that cost quite a bit less. You can get a decent mic, um, it, you know, a hundred bucks or so to a couple hundred bucks. Uh, it may not last forever. It may not have the best ears. It might not hear well. In some cases, that's a good thing. Uh, but it's good enough to get by until you uh, uh, have enough money from your career to to get a better mic. Let me let me follow up here with a question, Bill. Hang on one second, mm -hmm. Dave. I'd like to, you to answer the following. So, if you were giving advice, or if you yourself were just starting out right now and had limited funds. What would you get in terms of, let's say I gave you, I said to you, you know, um, you're just getting going in the voiceover business. You, you have a very limited budget. How much would you spend and what would you spend it on? You may not even know the start off or the startup kind of equipment people are using these days, but how would you allocate your funds? Well, first of all, chances are you have a, a computer already, so you're a long way the way there. Uh, Microphone-wise, MXL makes some great mics. Rode makes some great mics. Uh, there are a few other companies. I, I'm fond of the Apogee iPad mic. Uh, and if you have an iPad and uh, uh, or a Mac, Twisted Wave is a wonderful uh, program to record with. Uh, you can get free program with uh, um, oh, what is it? Um, oh, the name is slipping uh, from my brain. Uh, but there's some free programs out there, and if you're on a PC, there's other inexpensive programs. So you could probably put yourself together, assuming you have a computer already, you could probably put yourself together with, with a uh, uh, studio, or kind of a sort of a studio, with a closet with clothes in it for a couple hundred dollars. There you go. Bill, what are your thoughts? It's funny. I was just over at my, my daughter's house, Mallory, today, helping her scout out. Uh, her her work her voiceover workload is increasing, and she's looking to be able to work out of my studio in the evenings and on the weekends, at, you know, at her own home. And so we we were looking we're looking for the best place to record. And the the single most important thing that will affect your sound is actually the space you record in, provided your microphone is not that. complete garbage. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you have an awful awful mic, it doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, having a, a very quiet room and treated room. But then aside from that, you know, like what Dave was saying, you know, my first mic was an MXL mic and it worked just fine. Uh, my son, Alex, who's also getting now into voiceovers, uh, recently bought an Audio Technica. It's like a little shotgun microphone. And we were just doing some testing mm -hmm. with it. Holy cow, it sounded clean, crisp. And it didn't pick up nearly the amount of noise that a large diaphragm would. So how much does that cost, Bill? One hundred and sixty-nine dollars. One hundred and sixty-nine bucks. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, in, in Los Angeles, the the Sennheiser four sixteen, which is about a grand, you can probably find for about nine hundred, is a shotgun mic. It was called for a long time the LA mic because uh, this was the place where people started using it for voiceover. Its original purpose was. Uh, uh, for movies and television shows, that was a big mic that, that uh, they held over the heads of actors and still do. Uh, but it's very, very versatile. And uh, the mic you're talking about is very similar, the shotgun mic. And one of the good things about them is because they're very, very, very directional, uh, they don't pick up a lot of noise on either side of them. They, they pretty much... Wherever their point is, that's what they hear. And that's important when you're working out of a home studio and you're dealing with all that environmental noise. So, yeah, it's a great option. Absolutely. Got it. Uh, okay, so uh, Frank Bailey's asking, uh, Mark Graw told me that a video game voice actor can do most of his VO work from his own studio, unlike an animation voice actor who has to be there in studio, correct? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, it, it really depends on, you know, where their clients are and what they want. I do both. Uh, most of the uh, big games, they want me to come into studio. So I'm glad I live in L.A. because that's where we record. But uh, there are a lot of other games that I record from my home studio. Uh, and animation-wise, typically, you, they're still... Uh, a preference for uh, recording ensemble. 
So you want to get together with a whole crew of actors at the, a studio someplace. Uh, so you're usually called in for that. But because especially with celebrities now, it's getting more and more difficult to get everybody in the same room at the same time. Uh, often you will have uh, actors recorded individually. Uh, so it, it just depends. Good, good deal. Um, by the way, Robert Cortez was asking about this particular program, Robert, I think that's what you're asking about. This is a live event. If you go to the site, it's happening November 5th and 6th, and it's in, uh, it's in Illinois. So that, if that answers your question, I hope so. Um, uh, Lee Vidmar, I'm very new to VO and just had my demo completed. My question is how to get the first gig without ha having any credits to my name. Thank you. My answer would be in one word, Fiverr. But Bill, feel free to answer. <laughs> well, uh, I think first of all, let me address the, the whole the whole credits thing. I think there's a mistaken belief that and the people I hear this from people all the time. They say, "Well, you've got credits. I don't have credits." No, you know. So no wonder you get work. Well, I didn't have credits when I started. Neither did Dave. Neither, neither did any of us. And we still yeah. found work. Uh, your demo will, you know, will speak volumes of you. And I think ultimately that a client wants to know what you're capable of. Uh, they may be interested in what you've done. It may build your case, you know, but they ultimately, they just need to hear your demo for the opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so true. So everybody had a first job. Everybody had a starting place. Uh, and, you know, maybe uh, some of us charge more than others. And maybe they're looking for somebody very good that they can get at a little lower price because they don't have as much experience. So uh, you're in a perfect position. If your demo is good, uh, you, you got to do your marketing. And uh, Bill DeWeese is the guy to show you how to do that. <laughs> uh, question uh, for you, Dave, from Ron Greasley. Uh, did Dave hurt his voice when he yelled at the TV when his Golden State Warriors lost? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I had mixed emotions uh, about that because I grew up in Cleveland. So I was able to pull joy uh, mm. from the Cavaliers winning. And in the way they won, coming back from 1-3 and LeBron bringing the championship back to my hometown, I'm okay with it, okay? <laughs> I'm okay with it. That's great. Now, a lot of questions that I see coming from the audience here relate to gear, relate to things like sound booths, one from Michael Sessoms here, what vocal booth do you use? Let me again remind people, I am primarily a business person. I am not a voiceover artist, although I put a voiceover tape together before either of these gentlemen started, I might note. <laughs> um, I think that's right. I know you were doing radio, Dave, but I had a voiceover tape, demo tape together in 1985, Never did one audition, but that's besides the point here. <laughs> let, let me just note to everyone that as a, as a primarily a business person, I am seeing lots and lots of people ask about gear. I know, and both of you have people that you've talked to that literally have made money on their iPhones. Is this not correct? Bill, first. I, I've, I've heard rumor to that effect. Uh, I don't know that I personally know anybody, but I have I have heard a tell, tell of people that, that have done that. And so, just just in general, I want you and then go to Dave to address this question. If you're just starting out in the business or you have limited resources, where do you spend the money? Divide it between microphone, preamps, computer. Tell me where you spend your money. I give you a limited budget. Let's say five hundred bucks. If you give me five hundred bucks, well, that's going to start with my that's my studio budget. Three to five hundred bucks to get my studio up and running because I need to have the studio. Uh, but so well, before I start the training, before I start the demo, that's how I would start the process. And then I move to demo and train. Well, actually, I move to coaching and then to demo and then to marketing. So yeah. in other words, you now, Dave. Uh, what about you? Would would you? Not I, well, you know, if I were if I were starting out now, that's probably the path that I would take. Uh, when I started out, uh, you you know nobody had studios. You know you you went to a studio, but uh, nowadays uh, I would you know make sure that someplace in my house I had a nice quiet room. Uh, a closet with clothes in it is wonderful, uh, and I'd get a decent microphone. I you know have a laptop 
or an uh, iPad or a pad of some kind that I could record onto with something like Twisted Wave, which if you've got an iPad, it's, it's 10 bucks for the recording software. And once again, I have the studio and uh, then get my training and then get my demo together and then do my marketing. Hey, Dave, talk to people about the fact that when you, what is, what is it that you take with you when you go on the road and you have to record and how much do those elements cost, please? Well, I have an iPad Pro and an Apogee uh, iPad microphone, which is a small condenser mic uh, that will work with your iPhone, your, app, your computer, your iPad, or if you have some other kind of uh, pad, will work with that. Uh, and I use Twisted Wave, which is 10 bucks for the program on uh, iOS. Uh, but I also carry a backup, I believe, in backup systems. So I also have my, uh, oh boy, I'm, I'm driving here, so excuse me for uh, making an interesting little move. I also have uh, my laptop uh, that I carry with me uh, just in case. Okay, and so, that, and so again, is that now? Are there certain VO? Is there certain VO work that you wouldn't do on the road that you must do in your home, in your studio at home? Well, you're limited to to some of the things you can do uh, based on you know the room you're in, so forth and so on. Uh, but I I work from uh, when I'm out of town. I usually I'll, if I'll do a phone patch as opposed to uh, trying to connect over the internet, but yeah, I I work when I'm on the road. I when I was in uh, Mid East uh, last year, I did a lot of jobs in the middle of the night because <laughs> there was 12 hours difference. Uh, so I'd wake up at three o'clock for a four o'clock in the, three o'clock in the morning for a four o'clock in the afternoon job, things like that. Uh, and I used my iPad and my little Apogee mic, and nobody complained. Sounds good. And Very by the cool. way, uh, Richard Harris contributes that he auditioned a $17,000 Telefunken and a $500 mic from Mic Tech, and the Mic Tech sounded better with his voice. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, the more expensive the mic, the more picky it is about the room. I, I know I, I have a mic collection. And my U87 really wants a bigger room. Mm -hmm. uh, so he might have experienced that. That Telefunken might have wanted a room that was better treated than the one he was in. Sounds good. Okay. Fred, I just want to throw this out. Something I'm thinking about doing is actually doing a test and taking this mic that, Al that Alex, my son, just got, this $169 Audio uh, Technica little mini shotgun mic, and putting that in my studio for a few weeks. And just to prove that, again, I'm not saying go as cheap as you can, but what I what I am saying is that, you know, just because you play TaylorMade or Nike or Titleist golf clubs doesn't make you a PGA Tour player. Um, Absolutely. So I, that's something to kind of look forward to here soon. I'm kind of excited about trying that. Um, both of you can address this. I know, Bill, you've talked about this before, but Matt Meany wants to know, what, if any, processing should be used on audio files? Just enough to clean up, reduce noise, and avoid peaks uh, that are too hot? Or what do you use processing for first? Uh, let's go Dave first. Okay. Well, I uh, use very little processing. Um, and we are in a little different world now. I used to use none. Um, but there's just, just a hint of compression. Uh, but you want your files to be as clean as possible. You, you may run into clients that uh, want files that are, are completely processed. Um, that does happen nowadays, but I'm still a little bit old school and want to give them the cleanest files possible. Hey, Bill, what about you? Um, I probably process mine a little more than Dave, and the reason is because I know that most of my clients take what I give them and use it as is. And frankly, I don't know if all of them actually know the difference. So I want to make sure they have as finished a product as possible. So sometimes I hear things, I'll hear my work, and I'll think, oh, man, that should have been processed more. So um, I err on the side of a little more. Uh, you know, I run, I do run some compression, 
Uh, I don't squeeze the signal to make it sound like a big radio promo kind of thing, but I do compress it a little bit. I do a little EQ uh, just to make it sound a little more finished. And I make sure that, uh, and then I do a lot of editing and cleanup and all of that to make sure it's as clean as possible. But I do some, yeah, I do some processing. And again, folks, just to let you know, uh, Dave and Bill will be together. Uh, it's you know kind of like the uh, reunion tour here, but they haven't even gotten together. So it's, it's, it's uh, in in Illinois, uh, November fifth and sixth, VoiceOverRevolutionEvent.com. Uh, question from Wes Bauer. He says, when doing fifteen plus auditions a day, most times I read, edit, and submit one at a time. Is there any difference in doing this way as opposed to doing all the reads at once and then editing and submitting? Well, I have never uh, tried to do them all and then edit them. So I do I do them one at a time. One, uh, just because everyone's different, you're in a little different mindset, it's a little louder, a little less loud. I just, uh, I can't imagine trying to knock them all out and then cut them up and, and send them. No, I, I, one at a time. Yeah, and I, well, I, I concur with Dave on that one. And, and the reason is it does take a different, every script is a different context. It is a different mindset. And, and I like to do a read and then go back and start editing. And as I start listening more closely, then I usually get a better idea of what I want to do. And I'll come back and give it another read or two. Um, so that's my, yeah. that's my process. Okay. Uh, and here's one from Tyler Antcliffe who says, first of all, Bill, first of all, Bill, love the T-shirt. I don't see it. Uh, what Chewbacca. Is Okay, there we go. Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, serious question. I'm just starting out as a voiceover talent. I have all my equipment, and I'm working on prepping my studio space for recording. I'm concerned about how to get paid. Should I LLC right off the bat, even when working on voices, working three Craigslist, Reddit, etc.? Well, I think we're talking about two different issues. I mean, collecting your money and getting paid is different as uh, as a different issue than how you're organized as a company. It's that's more of a tax issue, and I wouldn't give it. I mean, I can tell you, I'm incorporated, but in terms of giving you advice, you need to talk to an accountant about that. But in terms of collecting your money, um, you know, that's something that we've been very successful. We have a nearly 100% collection rate and have had that for years. It just has to do with treating uh, collections as a marketing activity. and You cannot let people forget about you. Uh, Mr. Fenoy, I haven't really heard from you on this one. Um, I know that you, you know, especially when I come to your house for those charity events, you got to pay up front before you walk in the door. Same thing true with your bracelet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a few clients that uh, you know, pay me at the time that the job is done. But uh, my business model is a little different uh, than Bill's. Um, I have agents, uh, union member, so I have uh, people that collect for me. So uh, that's a little different. Uh, but once again, I, 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 the way the world is now and this business is now, uh, I, I think what Bill is doing and what uh, he is suggesting you do in terms of billing uh, is the way to, to build a business uh, that's not based on agents and the union. Okay, good one. Uh, Frank Phillips is asking, in Bill's books and your video series he bought, uh, you stress having a professional demo. What qualifications should I look for in someone to do my demo? What type of uh, studio should I look for, radio station, TV station, etc.? Private individual? Well, you know, I always tell people there are several things you can look at, but I think the most important thing, it begins with where clients, you know, like clients look for voice talent. They want to hear our demo. So if you want to hire a, a, a producer, I would start by asking to hear the demos they have produced. That will tell you, in my opinion, most of what you want to know about their capabilities. And any thoughts on that, Dave? I, I concur. I would go with somebody who has a, a track record of doing demos that have gotten people work. And yeah. speaking of demos that get people work, Scott Early is asking, where does Dave Fenoy suggest we get a character VO demo? Uh, well, there are a number of people that I could send you to. I'd, uh, right off the top of my head, uh, uh, Chuck Duran in, in L.A., uh, but there's there's some other people I could send you to, and 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 maybe that would be a, a private conversation. And I know Bill 
you do demos. I don't know if you yeah, do I don't do character, demos, though. Makes great demos. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't do character. Yeah, Bill, that's, uh, that we've, we've divided the work here very well, and, and uh, Dave is handling character, and Bill is handling <laughs> other. <laughs> um, good. So, yeah, I, I'm, again, but wouldn't it come down to finding, finding demo producers and listening to their work that they've done with clients and finding people that they've done character voiceover over demos for, correct? Absolutely, and one of the things that's happening now, thanks to the Internet and the explosion in this business, is people who make demos are shopping their work. So uh, you can go on the inter Internet and you can find uh, people who are producing character demos and listen to what they've got and, and uh, uh, do your checking and testing and uh, find somebody you like. Yep. Sounds good to me. Now, a uh, follow-up question from Scott. Is all the character VO work located in California, or is there any in, or in the Orlando area as well? Uh, no, it is not all located in California, uh, especially with the advent of video games and the democratization uh, that the Internet has given us. Uh, we do a lot of work here, but uh, in video games, uh, the Bay Area is very good. Austin, Texas is very good. Uh, Denver, uh, Washington, D.C., New York. There are a lot of places around the country wh where video games are being produced and other animations. Uh, more and more people, more and more uh, artists uh, are doing animation work uh, that falls in the category of entertainment also commercial, education, uh, but they're still using character voices. So uh, there, there are a lot of places to, to get this done. Got it. Uh, Kendall Brown, in answer to your question, go to this website and you'll find out all the information on location. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Daniela is asking, uh, so in a noisy environment, lots of surround noise, uh, should r rather go for a shotgun mic instead of a different one? In other words, when do you determine, and, and you're nodding yes, Bill, is that correct? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of environmental noise. I mean, I think, you know, the way Dave explained it, it was perfect. It's a, it's a very directional microphone, and it's going to mitigate a lot of that, you know, what you're dealing with. It's going to minimize that out, you know, extraneous noise to a certain degree. Whereas a large diaphragm like a Neumann TLM or U87, holy cow, I mean, it'll get everything. They hear everything. They all hear the crickets in the corner talking to each other. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, the, when I first came to I was doing promos for ABC, and I'm sitting in a room with five other guys that are handling all the equipment uh, in the room, and uh, I'm sitting right there with them, and the air conditioner is going, and we're using a, a, a Sennheiser 416 directional mic, and you heard nothing but me. Sounds good. That's, so yeah, now that's I want, all. Yeah, I want uh, both of you to weigh on this. So on Jeffrey Machado's uh, question, he says as the day goes on, his voice tends to get weaker, thinner, and more hoarse. Have you guys experienced this? And if so, do you find it's the result of wor overworking your voice or having a voice that's not strong enough to begin with? In other words, what happens as the day goes on, Dave? Yeah, well, you know, it, depending on the kind of work you're doing, yeah, your voice can get tired. You can lose some range and power over the course of the day. Uh, you got to take care of your instrument. Make sure you're giving it a little rest, uh, keeping it, uh, drinking a lot of water. Um, go on and have a cup of tea with some lemon and whatnot. Uh, and, and your voice is going to sound different. My voice is uh, much deeper early in the morning, uh, deep and gravelly. Uh, as the day goes on, it uh, gets clearer and rounder and smoother, and then later on in the day, it starts to have a little rasp to it. So, and uh, that's just life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is a more of a bill question, I think. Um, Kevin Skelly is asking, what credence do you give to the philosophy of sending out demos in a smaller neighboring market, for example, an Atlanta, uh, an Atlanta native sending something or marketing oneself to Birmingham, Alabama, say. Yeah, market yourself there and in Paducah, Kentucky and in Portland, Oregon and in, 
you know, Timbuktu. I mean, my philosophy is I, I don't see borders. I don't, it doesn't matter. You know, people are always saying, well, the Chicago market, that must be a tough market. Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think of myself as a Chicago guy. I'm just a voice talent. I get plenty of work from Chicago, but the people who hire me there don't even know I live here. They don't care because I work for my own studio. You know, I get hired from people. I get a lot of European clients. Uh, it, so don't think, don't think locally, truly think globally, because that will really open. Now, if you had to travel to the studio, that's one thing. But nowadays, for the most part, you know, we can work from home. So you really need to think more broadly. So absolutely market to Birmingham and any other place you can, you can think of. Any thoughts, Dave? Absolutely. I, I, I agree completely. Walter Bortz, who has already signed up to come to the Illinois event, so he gets a priority question in here. <laughs> uh, book for the VL conference in Kentucky, and really looking forward to it, he says. What is the typical time for clients to pay, Bill? What's your average receivable time? Well, I You know what? I, I, I couldn't quite hear that. Okay, no, I mean, I guess. Oh, it's you know good. what? I'll pick it up in the answer. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I was going to say, I, I, I apologize for my puppy. I don't know if you can hear him yapping over here. I'll. Hopefully he'll run away here in a few minutes. Not out of That's the house for me. That's the kind of like, we understand. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, we get most within 30 days, and then uh, a pretty big chunk will come in between 30 and 60, and then after that, it's, it's stragglers. But we always get our man or woman, whatever the case may be, eventually. Um, do you have anything to add? I, I, I typically, you know, about two weeks. Okay. About two. Um, for, you know, Don, I'm, I'm seeing the money. You got it. Uh, Don White, uh, do you have to have a demo completed before starting in Fiverr? Nope. People are making plenty of money without even a demo in Fiverr. So that's uh, how that Apple works. Um, I know that because I just talked to the man earlier today, Mr. Lance Temeshiro. Um Okay, so Glenn, uh, Glenn, I mean, Fluid, I hope I got the name right. An aspiring new talent, I'm confused how much clients expect me to produce the final voice tracks versus providing edited raw tracks so that more talents and engineers are able to get a finished product. Now, Bill and Dave, I think that both of you find that your case is the opposite. Am I not right? Uh, for me, definitely. I provide raw tracks. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't had the occasional client that can you, you know, can you produce the whole thing and, and, uh, it's not my favorite thing to do, but uh, I get to add a whole bunch of money to <laughs> to the cost. Uh, but you know, ninety nine percent of the time, it's just raw tracks. And, and, and by the way, Dave, when you have to take off, let me know, please. Oh no, I got another fifteen minutes. Dave, when you say raw, do you mean unedited? Say that again. When you say raw, do you mean unedited? Uh, well, there's a certain amount of editing. You know, I'm going to edit out the mistakes okay. and, you know, a certain amount of the breaths and that kind of thing. I, I, I want them uh, – what I try to do, say, for commercials, if it's a 30, it's going to be, uh, you know, 29 to 29.5. Okay. Uh, the 60, you, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give I'm going to give them something they can plug right in there. Um, right. I, I try – if they're – Particular times they need, I'm doing a narration. I try to match those times, uh, but I'm not, um, you know, I'm not adding music and sound effects and that oh. kind of thing. Right. Okay, okay. Good. And I'm exactly the same as Dave. I just wanted to make sure we we're speaking the same. And way. for this next question, I'm going to give a blatant plug to a member of my own family because it uh, has to do with the, the college fund. Uh, if you go to and just go to Fiverr and put in Kayla Brick. That's the name you're going to look for. Michael Sesson's questions: Do you need a headshot? Why spend money on a headshot when you can have a brilliant <laughs> done of yourself? Uh, taking a look at her work, she's done a lot of VO people, and uh, it's a lot cheaper. So, uh, do you need a headshot? The real answer, Dave Fenoy. Oh no, uh, no, you don't. You don't. Uh, and there was a time. I mean, I use a headshot now. Uh, because I've been around a long time, and, and uh, people like the dreadlocks and that kind of thing, and it's it's become kind of uh, part of the the, the brand. But uh, early in my career, I wouldn't put a a picture of myself on one. Uh, being a black man, I didn't want people to go, oh well, we can't use him because uh, this is a general market product. Um, 
And I've had a career where I do uh, things that are ethnic and things that are general market. So, uh, so I don't think a picture is necessary, but some kind of feeling in your brand that, that has a feeling of, of who you are and what you do uh, is much more important. Yeah, and just, just to follow up on that, my, I, I cut off my dreadlocks right before meeting Dave, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Bill, uh, did you get a, you didn't get a, did you get a professional headshot done? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I don't use a headshot on my website. Unlike Dave Fanoi, I don't have cool dreadlocks, and I'm not as well, <laughs> not as well known, so I don't, in terms of brand, I guess I've got a little work to do, but, but in all seriousness... Yeah, I'm. I don't want people to look. Let me get, let me tell you something. I get hired for jobs that are primarily. I'm cast for jobs that are ten to twenty or twenty five years younger than me, typically. Um, and so, uh, because I'm, you know, I'm not quite sixty, but I'm 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 getting up there. But I usually get cast in thirties and forties. And so I don't want somebody to look at me and say, "Oh, that guy's too old. He's too young. Yeah, he's too this. He's too that." He's too fat. It's like, what does that have to do anything? But yet people make, you know, they have perceptions based on what they see. Uh, and they think, they look at you and they, and they think they know what you sound like. And they don't. So, yeah, I just try to avoid that. Yet, yet someone in one of our groups, Sandra Perlmutter, who may be on the uh, webinar today, who talked about the fact that she very proudly said she was 74 years old but gets work for people that are probably 30 years younger than her. And uh, we're all in favor of that. Sandra has a beautiful British voice. There you go. Yeah, she does have a nice voice. Arturo Baez says, hello, guys. Uh, ISDN versus Soundstreak technology. Go Say ahead. that again? Yeah. So uh, different technology for recording kind of remote. ISDN versus Soundstreak or whatever other. I don't even know Soundstreak. Well, I, I don't know Soundstreak either, I but either. Uh, the, world is, the world is moving away from ISDN. Uh, it was industry standard for the last 30, 35 years uh, for remote uh, voiceover, uh, but the phone companies are supporting it less and less. Uh, sometimes you can, you, you can get it, and, but then you can't get anybody to service it. Uh, I've talked to a number of people going that way. So were I beginning now, I mean, I, I still have ISDN and I use it uh, frequently. Um, although I find a lot of clients uh, rather uh, re let me record the files and send them to them. But uh, were I starting today, I wouldn't worry about ISDN. Uh, there's Source Connect and a number of other uh, ways you can go. I Bill, I think controls. Yeah, yeah. I dropped ISDN a year ago, and I've been using uh, Source Connect. I've never lost a gig because of it. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, you know, I think that Mr. Fenoy sometimes will bristle at this response, but uh, Joanna Garcia is asking, there's so many steps that need to be taken to begin a VO career, i.e. demo, website, auditions, etc. What should be the first step after setting up a home studio? I would take a first step before setting up a home studio, which is I would generate some money first by going on Fiverr, generating some cash to be able to afford your home studio. I mean, you know, I keep, I sound like a broken record. But I'm telling you, if I'm advising someone from a business standpoint, I would always tell you, make money before spending it. I don't care what business we're talking about. And, Bill, I know that bites into a little bit of your demo production concept. Oh, no. I, well, here, here's the thing. You have to understand, this is when you get into voiceovers, you're not, it's not a job that you get. It's a business that you're launching. And you have to expect that there are expenses involved. And if you're not prepared to, to, to spend that money, you should really seriously reconsider starting at that point in time. Uh, you know, I hear it all the time, well, I can't afford to, well, then, you know, can't, you know, a lot of people can't afford to buy a McDonald's franchise, and you just don't. Uh, but if that's your goal, if that's your dream, <laughs> then you get the money. You know, you figure it out over time, maybe. It might take a long time, but, you know. People uh, typically find a way to get the things they really, really want. Not true. necessarily the things they need, but definitely the things <laughs> they really, really want. And if you really want a voiceover career, uh, you will find ways to not eat that extra hamburger or uh, you know buy that extra this, that, or the other. Um, cut back on whatever it is you need to cut back on uh, to make and make those sacrifices to get the thing you really, really need to make your career happen. 
I don't think this is Martha Clark of OJ fame, but M. A. Clark asks, uh, "What point can you tell? At what point can you tell an overly picky client that you can't do what they are asking?" Dave, why don't you shoot? Uh, you know, you really need to start at the beginning. Uh, if you're talking to a client uh, about doing a job for them, uh, this is why we need contracts. Uh, you need to know how many revisions, how many times are you are willing to come back and fix something. Uh, you know, if they get one, two, or three, uh, it's up to you. But at that point, they understand that they have to pay more money uh, beyond whatever it is you guys agreed upon. What a perfect set. Speaking of not paying more money, voiceoverrevolutionevent.com, the price goes up <laughs> at the end of this month. <laughs> Man, was that perfect. That was masterful. Uh, <laughs> just led right into that. Uh, Bill, I know that your approach is different on this topic. Why don't you share what it is? Well, I, you know, I can think of one time where I really had the situation where I needed to tell a client, this is not going to happen. And it was recently. And the scenario, very briefly, was it was through Voices.com. And it was it was a, a commercial, which frankly did not pay as much as I would typically go for. But it was handled by a project manager. And, I, and for political reasons, I wanted to make sure that I had the attention of the project managers. And that's a whole other discussion. But anyhow, so I agreed to do the spot for a lot less than I typically would. Uh, and I gave them two or three reads up front just to make sure they had something to choose from, feeling like I was doing them a favor in all honesty. Well, they came back with more feedback. Okay, fine. And there was no, there's no contract on how many, you know, retakes uh, or pickups. And so I give them a few more reads. No, still not what we want. We need to do a phone session. Oh, my gosh. At this point, I'm ready to pull my hair out. But I, you know, part of it is I don't want to strand voices.com. And I don't like to let clients down either. I thought, well, get on the phone five minutes. We'll have it figured out. Because usually, phone, you know, an actual recording sessions, it's very quick, painless, easy. Over and over and over. No, a little more of this. No, a little more of that. I had never experienced anything like it in my life. And I said, and then finally I just said, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but this is for the $100, and that's what I was paying, 100 bucks. I said, oh, my I had goodness. no intention of spending this much time. I, I literally thought it was a five-minute job. And I said, you need to find somebody else. Now, I still got paid for that. Uh, Voices.com was gracious enough to make sure I got my 100 bucks. But it was not worth whatever political clout that yeah. I thought it would get me with that project manager. But you, you, you ended up working for about five bucks an hour. Exactly. It's almost like recording audiobooks, Dave. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Let's not go down that road. Um, well, you know, uh, when I was on the radio, one of the things I learned – uh, was that the clients who spend the least, the advertisers who spend the least, are going to take up the most amount of time uh, trying to make sure that their spot is running at the right time and I didn't get enough of this and the DJ talked over a little part. Yeah, they, the big clients are spending big money. You never hear from them. They never complain. It's the ones that are spending uh, just itty bitty bits about, of money that give you all the problems. That's the truth. Well, before you leave, Dave, we have a promotion for one of your items. Kyle Sauerhofer is asking where you get and gain knowledge about the field of voice acting. So, folks, uh, it's not, I don't even know if it's actually, actually up and running yet, but the videos from the last event that Dave did in Los Angeles about five, six weeks ago, voiceactingforgames.com, is now up and ready for business. Again, we'll contact you to let you know a little bit more about that. But if you want to get on there right away because you can't wait, uh, I can't tell you that all the technical issues have been worked out, but uh, we will do our best. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But, yeah. So uh, those, those, we did a recording. We recorded both audio and video. It's, uh, it's not quite as good as being there in person, but one of the ways that we're getting around that is if you do get that program via uh, video, and it's a streaming video, uh, you then get 10% off if uh, when you attend live at some point in the future. So, Dave, I know you got to run. Should I let you go now? Yeah, i got to run here. Uh, we got to run, uh, uh, do a little teaching here. I'm at, at SAG After Now and SAG After Plaza. Uh, but always a pleasure to uh, share some time with Bill DeWeese. Uh, from the first time I saw your videos, Bill, I, I was impressed. And for those of you who are on this call, 
um, you know, it, it, it's the real deal. And I'm happy that the two of us are doing some things together. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. And I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be working with you. Thanks a lot, Dave. Go have a good session tonight. All right. See ya. No, bye -bye. Okay, bye. Okay, so now all we've got, uh, all we've got, it's just Bill and me. So I know that's a big letdown to most. Um, okay, so uh, Charlie Tennyson is asking, uh, just like you work out every day, Bill, how do you work out your voice? I'm sorry, who works out every day? <laughs> oh, like Fred works out every day, not like me, I see now. Uh, you know, I work out my voice by recording uh, a lot of stuff every day. Honestly, I don't. I really don't do a lot of, uh, of warm. I certainly don't work out my voice because I'm usually recording for a number of hours every day. Um, and, and here's what I do. I don't really have exercises that I do, but what I do is I start with the easiest project of the day. Usually that's an e-learning that doesn't require a whole lot of focus, concentration, or acting. And I start with that. That's very, you know, middle of the road, very normal voice, you know, human resources type stuff where I'm just giving instructions. And then as the day progresses, I'll get more into the automotive commercials where it requires higher energy or direct response and all that. So that that's how I... Uh, schedule my day to help my voice accommodate what I need to get done. And a uh, question from Mike DeBoard, who, by the way, is a very well-known radio personality in his local market. I'm now forgetting which one it is. I apologize, Mike. Uh, I believe it's somewhere in the Midwest, just to keep mm. it very clandestine. Uh, he's asking if at the Voice Over Revolution event, uh, are we going to be talking about how to get work as well as how to perform? And we may want to give people a little bit of what that, what, what's that going to be and how is that going to be divided up? Well, uh, you know, Dave's taking a day and I'm taking a day and there actually might be some other uh, surprise elements throw, thrown into there as well that still, we can't, I think it's still on the down low, but we're kind of working on some maybe surprise bonuses. Um, oh, yeah. But what I'll be focusing most of my time on are uh, what I have found to be the most viable ways to get opportunities through clients. So I'll be spending some time on pay to play because that I think that is the right now that's where a lot of the money is shifting to. Over the past ten years, there's been a major shift. You can see more and more clients when I when I call prospective clients on the phone. Many of them are telling me now, well, now we cast through Voice One Two Three. We cast through Voices.com. And so I've got a response to that, by the way, but you have to be on pay to play to be able to, to do it. So I'll be talking about positioning yourself to make your life easier through pay to play, how to get clients to come to you so you don't have to go to them. Believe me, it can be done, and it happens to me almost every day. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, you know, getting in front, how, the direct marketing route. I still, I'm a firm believer in direct marketing and how to get yourself in front of the right people and how to stay remembered by the right people. So that's... In a nutshell, what I'll be doing on the first day of, uh, of the revolution event. Hey, Bill, just give people the nuts and bolts. Um, given the fact that people have to pay for the event, they probably have to pay for travel, they probably have to pay for a hotel room, and they have to pay for a few meals. So after this is all said and done, we're talking about maybe close to $1,000. Is there a way to justify that $1,000 fee and the information people will be receiving when they get there? Well, yeah, but only if you put it to use. Um, and I guess that goes without saying, but absolutely. I mean... Again, this is not a pep rally. That's what you have to understand. This is not a pep rally. You'll feel that way. We'll feel that way. We're going to have a lot. It'll be very exciting. Uh, but the purpose of it is, remember, you're being equipped and reminded and taught new information that you can implement in your business. And um, so the purpose of this is to help you build a business. I can think of very few things that I think are as deserving as your, you know, of your resources uh, as then something like this because you can expect a return on investment if you're willing to put in the work and put it to use when you get back home. Now I don't know if this is his if this is an alias or if this is his real name, but Fred Dog and uh, D O G G F Dog asked the following yeah, he asked the following question. There seems to be and you you you're perfectly positioned to answer this, Mr. DeWeese. There seems to be an industry of voiceover coaches and training lately. That's because they saw Bill doing it and succeeding and everybody tried to jump on the bandwagon, I'll just say that. Are the vets moving to training due to the plethora of pay to play and the dollars for actually voiceover work being driven down? In other words, are people getting into the training? First off, I want you to talk a little bit about the the money that you make. People have this uh, 
distorted idea, I think, that you're currently making more money selling training work, oh. demo production, et cetera, than you do from voiceover work. Can we dispel that myth, please? I make a lot more money recording voiceovers than doing training. Yeah. And certainly per hour. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, voiceover is way more, way more lucrative. Uh, I started doing this because uh, I, I just, at the time, I, I saw a need for it, and people wouldn't quit bugging me about it. And so I just began to, you know, when there's demand, I thought I would try to, to give, you know, to supply that. It just grew into more than I ever expected. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't speak on behalf of these people. I can tell you what, what I think is happening. Uh, they, it's true that many of these people who back in the day were making pretty good money doing this, they're not making as much money. But it's not because there's not as much work or not as much money in the market. It's because everything's shifted and they don't know what to do to get it. So they're trying. Again, I'm, I'm, I think it's a pretty guess, a pretty good guess. But I think what they're trying to do is fill the gap financially by doing what they can do and, and try to teach people how to be, you know, to perform, to be voiceover performers. Um, and a lot of them, even though they see the model shifting, they don't, you know, it, they, they don't want to pick up the telephone to call prospective clients. They don't want to audition on pay-to-play sites. They sure as heck aren't going to go on Fiverr uh, because for them, it's all about trying to maintain a certain level of, uh, I don't know if integrity is the right word, but they want to be perceived in a certain way by their peers. Now, some guy named Lance says that by buying Ping golf clubs, it brought his handicap down by 12 strokes. <laughs> Maybe I'm misinformed on that, but I'll tell you, Lance, when I started, pl I played some Titleist, then I went to TaylorMade, and I just kept getting worse, so I don't know what my problem is. Uh, okay. Uh, Frank Bailey says, Bill, make a note for this. You should do a, make a YouTube video with that shotgun mic. I like the idea. Yeah, and that's what I do intend to do. I think I might give it a one-week or two-week trial and just see if anybody notices that me going from the $1,000 to the $169 mic now this is provided I can dial in a very close sound so that my clients don't say, whoa, you know, I'm from an EQ perspective because I have to do pickups and all that kind of stuff. But anyhow, yes, I plan to document it on video. And, and Tammy is asking whether or not voiceover conventions are worth the time and money. You know what, Tammy, i got to tell you, Depends. and again, I know a lot of the players in the various fields here. Um, I really don't think, I, I literally would not be involved with Bill unless I thought that what we did was far superior to any of the competition out there. So I can only tell you that from my limited experience, if you go to any of Bill's or the Dave events that I'm, I'm involved in, as a business person, that was my concern, which is to work with professionals that are delivering many, many more times the dollars that you've spent in terms of value. So, Tammy, I would not recommend others only because from what I hear, and again, it is just hearsay, they don't meet the same level of criteria as what the stuff that Bill and Dave are doing. So um, I, I'm being totally honest. Um, talking about taxes, Henriquez Devon, um, you know what? Um, I'll tell you, uh, he's talking about, he says, talking about tax, I know some people do a lot of gigs per day. Is the paperwork somehow consolidated? Seems like you can have a mountain of paperwork fairly quickly. Well, Bill, we ought to bring Mallory in here for the amount of paperwork involved. Oh, tell us about She could tell you a thing or two about that. Yeah, I mean, you do have to document. You enter everything. And we use FreshBooks. That's our accounting program. Every job, regardless of size, is entered in, you know, to that program. Now, once you know how to work the program, it's not as time-consuming as it may sound to you. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, if you're doing 10 gigs a day, uh, when I say gigs, I'm not talking about Fiverr specifically. I just mean 10 jobs a day. If you're billing 10 clients, you know, individually, then you've got to have record of that. Um, I'll tell you, let's see here. Uh, Edmund Blanchard, who I haven't heard his name before, a new person to voiceovers, he says, my question is about demos. Mm -hmm. Is it best to have a clean demo with voice only or with background? Well, where should people look at to find out about your demo and demo services, just to give them an idea? Yeah, well, I tell you what, if you drop me an email at voiceoverexpert at gmail.com, I will send you, number one, uh, a bunch of samples of demos that I've produced recently, as well as, as all the details. Uh, specifically to your question, your, your demo should be fully produced, meaning um, it should sound like it was taken right off of network television. 
which means that the read should be should be directed and performed in such a way. It should be edited in such a way. It should be processed in such a way. It should be produced with music and sound effects in such a way that it sounds like it was literally pulled off of ABC, NBC, or CBS. And uh, it's no simple chore to do that, but that's, if you want to be perceived as top tier and competitive, that's, that's what you need. Okay, and again, a very similar question in a way uh, from Mark Aaron Gilman, he's building a facility and looking at software. Uh, I assume that you are a business person who is building a facility as opposed to a new talent. That's my guess and my hope. Uh, he's looking at software. My understanding is the Twisted Wave is mono only, so no adding SFX or music under, etc. I need a DAW for finished audio other than straight raw VO. I have no experience with any DAW. No preference. What I might, what might I use to produce demos or finished audio? The reason why I'm a l chuckling a little bit, Mark, is we're currently in the middle of a discussion with a number of people as to which is the best and why. <clears throat> Given what you currently know, Mr. Deweese, what would you answer? Well, if the focus is voice over work, and frankly, the focus of voice over work, you typically doesn't include full production. I rarely ever, unless I'm producing somebody's demo, it's just straight voice, which mono is fine. But assuming you do need something more than that, um, you know, the, 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 the DAW of choice for most voice over talent is Adobe Audition. It's geared more toward voice over work. A lot of people use Pro Tools. Some people use um, Studio One. Uh, that's something that we're, we were currently looking at. Uh, and, you know, we have to mention Audacity. It's a free, you know, it's a great place to start if you're working with a limited budget. Audacity for Windows and Mac. You can, you can start with that. It's a pretty good program. Um, and as one of the final questions of the night, Leah Frederick says, I've done a lot of audiobooks, God bless you for that, through ACX, as Bill has done in the past, mm -hmm. uh, what are the 35 or so? 41, but who's counting? 41. Oh, yeah. All 41 painful numbers there. And I'm wondering if you have any tips on getting through to the big publishers so you can get paid even less for your no answer. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of the big publishers do use ACX, but I tell you, first of all, let's, let's define big. If you want to do New York Times bestsellers, that's through an agent. You've got to be represented by a top agent for that. That's the only way you get exposure uh, to those. Uh, aside from that, you need to market directly to the publishers. And you literally, you, you look them up online and you call them and ask them if they're currently accepting demos from voice talent. And that's the way you do it. I like that Leah says, it is ditch digging job. It is the ditch, ditch digging job of voiceover, but I enjoy the character work. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, hey, nothing wrong with the audiobooks. Uh, you can certainly make yeah, a decent when living. When you are independently wealthy, I think doing audiobooks is a great idea. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, but if you see my preference away from audiobooks, it's because of all the stories that I've heard from the various VO talent as to the amount of actual dollars per hour generated from that work. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Paul. Paul, is it Bisson? I think this is our second to last question here. A pro demo is not going to reflect my home workspace slash equipment output. How many clients are put off by the quality difference between the demo and the actual work. Well, first of all, I don't know what that difference is going to be. I mean, I know what my studio sounds like. I know what the demos sound like that I produce out of it. I don't know what your home studio sounds like. Uh, presumably, yeah. if it, let me jump in there. So let's assume that you were producing Paul's demo. Yeah. You you would be coaching him via Skype or a phone line to talk into his equipment into his mic, correct? That's. The, well, you, my clients have a choice. You can record from your home studio, and I'll coach you over Skype. It, and I want to hear it first to make sure it's suitable. Uh, otherwise, you can come into my studio. But I would say, you know, more than half, eighty percent of my clients record from their home studio. So what we do end up with—that's a good point, Fred—is been done in their studio. Now I process it on my end, but your client should not expect a fully processed. I mean, that's you know, that's that's pretty advanced engineering stuff a lot of times. Yeah, Michael, in answer to your question, do I own stock in Fiverr? No, but I can tell you this. As a business person, if you can get me an unlimited supply of buyers and give away a 20% commission, I'll do it in any business on the planet or on the face of the earth, period, full stop, end of story. You show me anywhere 
that you can get that and get started without a demo. I'm doing it and a story. <laughs> Um, anyway, we got one more here, and that's we. Uh, let's see, let's see here. One more. Uh, okay. Uh, one second. One second. One second. Okay. Huh. Let's see. I guess. Man, I gotta get a good one here. Um, let's. You know. Somebody, Monique, let me just tell you, if you want to ask questions, you sent me a five-part question. There are close to 300 people on here now. Uh, you sent me a five-part question. I'm going to ignore it. So for the future, keep it pithy. Um, and so that's one of the things we have to do because there's, you have no idea. I don't get to one-tenth of the questions. Selection. Remember the first Van Halen record vocals were done on a Shure SM58 parentheses 100 because that's what David Lee Roth used live well I didn't realize that but I do know that a lot of the stuff that we consider classics today if we if you knew exactly the equipment they were using you would probably cringe but artists know how to make good stuff happen with less than stellar equipment it's the artistry it's the skill of the artist it's not it's not so much the equipment um, as a final question uh, back to I think it's M.A. Clark who says, what about critiquing a demo? How do you do that? Is that something, should they send you that, uh, an email at voiceoverexpert at gmail.com? Well, I mean, I, you know, I can do that part, uh, part of coaching. Otherwise, I mean, I can't critique everybody's demos because there's just no time, there's not enough time in the day to do that. But if you're, if you're considering you want to, uh, doing a demo and you're not sure whether you should or where you stand with your current demo, I'll be glad to give you feedback on it. But the things that I'm listening for, I'm listening for several things. Number one, I want to hear your range performed in the demo. I want to make sure that it's really, you know, that it's that it's a broad range of your personality. Also, want to make sure it reflects your authentic personality, and it's not you doing this uh, radio broadcast phony voice kind of thing, which I hear a lot. I also want to make sure that the audio is recorded and mastered and produced in such a way that's very polished and finished and is network quality. So those are three of the major, major things I'm listening for. And also, and then and just one other quick thing is, you know, is it about 60 seconds in length or does it go two and a half minutes? Because that would be a problem. Um, and I realize, Bill, that the whole time we've been doing this, I have not been recording it. I have. Oh, thank God. Do you know that for sure? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident. Oh, well, I hope you are, because I just looked up and went, oh, I better press stop, and it's like, oops, it ain't there. So hey, Fred, I'm let me just, While we're talking about demos, let me throw this out real, real quick before we wrap up, in that uh, something that, I, that I'd like to do soon is I, I want to do a webinar on demos. I know a lot of people want to do their own, and I, what I'd like to do is kind of outline, so those of you who really want to DIY it, that you understand what needs to happen for clients to pay attention to be competitive, because there are some people who do have the skill set to do the production end of things. They may need to be uh, directed from the outside, but uh, but I, there's some things I can help you with. And even if you have somebody else produce your demo, it at least gives you a working vocabulary and understanding of the process so that you're knowledgeable when you're shopping for a producer or working with a producer. And I think we may probably make it really inexpensive, pretty cheap, but you know, more to, more to be said on that later. Yeah, well, as we finish up here, let me just remind everyone, the reason why you want to sign up for voiceoverrevolutionevent.com before the end of the month is as the as after as of August 1st the price is going up and there will be just like with music we're introducing a few other acts that will make this that will skyrocket the registration and you will not believe some of the people that we have you know it's kind of like uh, you know like a concert i remember when i saw the stones in 76 they had Phoebe Snow, Atlanta Rhythm, Jay Giles, and you know we have a lot of players that uh, hopefully that we are, we're going to be getting to come to the table. So, Bill, any final thoughts before we uh, close this up and hope we get a recording? Hey, just make sure you get registered. Uh, you know, take advantage of the lower price, and there really is nothing like being there in person. And uh, it's great to, to to network and to fellowship with your your colleagues in the business. I look forward to meeting you, and there's just going to be tons of great information. So, I really hope you can come. There you go, folks. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. And, Bill, call me to make sure that this did get recorded.